So today, we're very glad to welcome Chris Kolakowski uh, from the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison. Uh, Chris was born and raised in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He received his BA in History and Mass Communications from Emory and Henry College, and his MA in Public History from the State University of New York at Albany. Chris has spent his entire career interpreting and preserving American military history with the National Park Service, New York State Government, the Rensselaer County Historical Society, the Civil War Preservation Trust, Kentucky State Parks, and the U.S. Army. He's written and spoken on various aspects of military history from 1775 to the present. He's published two books with the History Press, The Civil War at Perryville, which we're going to learn more about today, uh, Battling for the Bluegrass, and The Stones River and Tullahoma Campaign, This Army Does Not Retreat. Uh, Chris became director at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison on January 6, 2020, so he's relatively new to the state. So we welcome him here again to the Civil War Museum. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I do want to correct one small item in my biography. I am, it is true, I'm relatively new to Wisconsin as a resident, but my mother's family helped settle New Glarus back in 1845. As a matter of fact, that's one of my Civil War ancestors. Um, and I got other family from up near Elroy. As a matter of fact, Tommy Thompson babysat my, my mother once in Elroy. So I have been coming here at least once a year, so this has always been kind of a spiritual home for me. So I do, do want to issue that slight correction um, there as well. My three, re three relatives that fought in the Civil War all fought in Wisconsin units, one of whom was involved in this campaign that we're going to talk about here today. By show of hands, how many of you have ever been to Perryville Battlefield State Historic Site? Great. That's great. And I know Doug is thinking about a tour in the next year or two sponsored by the museum so keep on him about going back and seeing Perryville as well and one of the reasons we're talking about the Kentucky campaign is because as you probably can tell as you study the map here and we'll talk more about that in just a second the Battle of Perryville which was the largest and bloodiest battle ever fought in the Commonwealth of Kentucky occurred today 159 years ago October 8, 1862 when you go to the battlefield, for those of you who have been, you know it's called the Battle for Kentucky. It's the largest and bloodiest battle. It also decides the Confederate invasion of 1862 and that fate, the fate of that expedition. Abraham Lincoln said in 1861, he said, I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Well, in the late summer and early fall of 1862, it sure looked like that might be the case. And the battle that determined whether that would happen was Perryville 159 years ago today. So as I mentioned, Perryville is October 8th of 1862, but to tr and it's right here in the middle of Kentucky, and I'll orient you to the map here in just a second. But to truly understand how we get to this point, to understand the context of the battle, we actually need to rewind the clock a little bit to the end of July 1862. It's been a very dark time for the Confederacy, a dark spring and a dark summer. Federal forces have advanced down through Kentucky. They've captured Fort Henry and Donelson in February of 1862, fought and won the Battle of Shiloh, advanced to Corinth, taken Memphis, and are now spreading amoeba-like through middle and western Tennessee. Of course, north is at the top. Here's southern Illinois. In fact, Springfield would be right where I have the cursor. Indiana. Here's Kentucky. Of course, Tennessee. Northern Mississippi, Northern Alabama, Northern Georgia, and then the Carolinas right here. Chattanooga, Tennessee is really the last major, Chattanooga and Knoxville are two, the last two major Tennessee cities not under federal control as July of 1862 comes to end. But the Federal Army of the Ohio, 55,000 men under Don Carlos Buell in this area is moving slowly toward Chattanooga to try and capture Chattanooga which if you're familiar at all with the Civil War, you're very well aware that Chattanooga, whoever controls it, controls the gateway to the Deep South. So the blue tide is rolling, the blue tide is rolling forward, and the two senior Confederate officers in the West meet in Chattanooga on the last day of July 1862 to discuss what they can do to try and reverse what's happened. 
These two men, Braxton Bragg, commander of the Army of the Mississippi, about 30,000 men, and Edmund Kirby Smith, who commands the 15,000 men in and around Knoxville Department of East Tennessee, soon to be renamed the Army of Kentucky. And as they look at the map, their eyes, particularly Kirby Smith's eyes and to an extent Bragg's eyes, are drawn northward. They consider a direct strike on, strike on Nashville, but there's a lot of problems, particularly logistics with that. But as they look at the map and look at opportunities to go on the offensive, let's be honest, staying on the defensive is not an option. Doing nothing is not an option. So they decide we're too weak to defend, let's attack, let's try and find a way to strike and roll back the blue tide. And as they look at this, their eyes are drawn for that strike to make that strike into Kentucky. Now there are several reasons as they look at the map and they consider Kentucky that they realize that this is a place to have an army. The first, geography. What is the northern boundary of the Confederacy this 31st of July, 1862? It's the Kentucky-Tennessee border, which if you've ever driven that, you know it's an indefensible line in the dirt. It is no different than the Illinois-Wisconsin border, just a little ways I, that way from where we are. Sorry, I was pointing at the lake, I just realized. But if you can turn Kentucky from a blue state to a gray state, what becomes the northern boundary of the Confederacy? The Ohio River. Even now, it's a major military obstacle. Imagine it in 1862 with the technology they had available. It becomes a very formidable defensive position. There's another reason why geography is important. What the Mississippi is to the south, the Ohio is to the north. If you cut the Ohio at any point, everything downstream wither and dies on the vine for lack of supplies. That includes, for example, Ulysses S. Grant's army at Memphis, which is beginning to plan a strike south along the Mississippi River toward a city you've probably heard of at some point, Vicksburg, Mississippi. The main supply base for the entire federal effort west of the Appalachian Mountains is Louisville, Kentucky. That's Louisville if you don't speak Kentuckian. <laughs> Are there opportunities here for the South? You better believe it, to cripple the North. Louisville may, may be the main supply base. The forward supply base for Buell's Army and for most of the federal troops in Tennessee is here at Nashville. What connects the two? The 183 miles here of the Louisville-Nashville Railroad you might actually be able to liberate, and I use that word intentionally because it's the only state capital the Union controls at this point, with the except, uh, with the, uh, no, actually with the, no, they haven't taken Baton Rouge yet. By cutting the railroad, you force the Federals to pull back into Kentucky to fight you, and they give up all their gains of the spring and summer. So geographically, there are reasons to go to Kentucky, but there are other reasons to go to Kentucky. One of the other reasons for these outnumbered Confederate officers, fighting men. 100,000 Kentuckians served in the United States Army during the war. 40,000 served in the Confederacy. John Hunt Morgan, who was a Lexington native, had raided up northeast of his hometown in July and had just come back and reported, with 800 men, I was up there, and if I had a force big enough to stay, thousands of Kentuckians would join the cause. So that's music to Bragg and Kirby Smith's ears, the idea that Recruits are just waiting for the Confederates to show up. But there are other resources here in Kentucky that will help these armies. And I'm referring specifically to, to Kentucky's most famous legal non-liquid product. Horses, I know. I always have to say non-liquid because everybody immediately is like, I get all kinds of guesses. It's not the bourbon, although the bourbon certainly makes things better. But it's the horses. Then, as now, the central bluegrass is one of the best sources of good quality horse flesh in all of North America. Now, think about Civil War armies. What gasoline is to today's armies, horses and mules were to Civil War armies. And so if you can control this, it's a tremendous asset for the Confederacy. One more resource. Have they had an uninterrupted planting season in Tennessee because of all the military operations? The answer to that is no but they sure have in Kentucky. So if you go up there in the late summer, you'll be up there in the fall, most likely, which means you'll be able to take advantage of the harvest. 
from an uninterrupted growing season. You'll also be able to feed your army as well. So when you put all these factors together, Bragg and Kirby Smith realize Kentucky is the place to go. And so that tips off the Kentucky campaign, which starts on the 14th, 15th August, 18, 1862, when Kirby Smith, with 21,000 men, moves north up what today we know as I-75, US-25, aiming for the central bluegrass, Lexington and the state capital up here at Frankfurt. You peel off about 9,000 men to, to watch the federal garrison that's right here at the Cumberland Gap, and everybody else will move north. This panics the north. They weren't expecting an invasion at this point. And they scratched, scraped together a bunch of Illinois and a bunch of Ohio units that have just joined the Army. Many of these guys will fire their rifles for the first time ever at live targets wearing gray. And these 7,000 men will meet these hard case Confederate veterans here at the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky, 30 miles south of Lexington, on the 29th and 30th of August, 1862. At the end of the day on the 30th, of those 7,000 men, 4,400 will be captured, over 1,000 will be killed or wounded. They will inflict less than 1,000 casualties on Kirby Smith's army. The Battle of Richmond, which is also a preserved battlefield, the Battle of Richmond is the most lopsided Confederate victory of the entire war. Now, if I'm going to pick 48 hours, by the way, to be a Confederate, I'm going to pick the 29th and 30th of August, 1862, because what else is going on, specifically in Virginia, on those days? Second Bull Run. Bull Run up here. I grew up in Virginia. It's Manassas. But I digress. Robert E. Lee wins what I argue to be his greatest victory when he sweeps John Pope's army off the field and back into the defenses of Washington on the 29th and 30th of August, 1862. So these are two, this is two, the, probably the brightest 48-hour period for the Confederacy in the war. They take Richmond, they move up into Lexington and, and uh, take, the, take Lexington on September 2nd. You should know, by the way, that Lexington in 1862 was only 300 people smaller than Atlanta. It was also known as the Athens of the West because it was the center of higher education in the West at the time. Of course, it has lost both of those crowns over time. It's a very different situation. I will tell you also that the party that they threw for Kirby Smith's troops lasted 48 hours. And if you remember the party that they threw when they won the national championship, the basketball championship back in 2012, if you remember that party, it makes that party look like nothing. They are happy to see them. And of course, who's from Lexington? Mary Todd Lincoln, the first lady of the United States. So this is deeply ironic, considering. Troops will occupy Frankfurt, only capital of a loyal state captured by the Confederacy in the war was Frankfurt, Kentucky, September 4th, 1862. And then patrols will push out toward Louisville and push north and probe the Cincinnati defenses. For those of you, piece of trivia that may win you a bar bet one day, for those of you who are familiar with the Battle of Gettysburg, the first Confederate division commander that opened the battle was a guy named Harry Heath. Harry Heath was commander of the column the previous fall that probed the Cincinnati defenses. That may win you a bar bet one day. Meanwhile, Bragg leaves Chattanooga with his army and moves north into Kentucky and the central Kentucky as well. And Bragg's Bragg's aiming for the Louisville-Nashville Railroad specifically, and his army will brush up against the 4,000-man federal garrison here at Munfordville, guarding a key road and rail bridge over the Green River. Now, imagine a river the width of, say, I-41, just right over here, with very steep banks on them that are several hundred feet high. Okay, so this is a very important place. If these bridges are destroyed... If that garrison is overwhelmed, these bridges are destroyed, it's going to be a real problem for the United States. That's why, since the previous December, there's been 4,000 men here guarding those bridges. Bragg's army brushes up against them, surrounds them, and prepares to destroy the place by assault on the evening of September 16th. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about this Munfordville situation that illustrates something that, that we should never, ever forget is when we look at maps like this, or we look at photographs, you look at the exhibits in this museum, for example, it's easy to forget, it's easy to distance yourself from them as people in this 159 years ago. 
It's easy to look at these as blue and red arrows or black and white photographs. But we should never forget these are people just like us. And this is one of the great human dramas of the Civil War, in my opinion, and one of the great stories that illustrates that lesson better than any other is the night of September 16th, 17th, 1862. Bragg's army with 30,000 men has surrounded the federal garrison. They've got the hills surrounded, studded with guns. Everybody expects the next morning that most Federals will be seeing their final sunrise. Bragg does send a request to the commander of this post, a guy named John Wilder from Indiana, requesting him to surrender, or you will be destroyed in the morning. Now, what was the last surrender of a major U.S. force that John Wilder would have known about? Because he wouldn't have heard about Harper's Ferry that occurred the, on September 15, 1862. Does anybody know? I'll save you the trouble. Charleston, 1780. Thankfully, they don't teach you how to surrender in the United States Army. Wilder has no idea what to do. So he sends back a message. Unless you can demonstrate your superiority, I will fight it out. Bragg gets this message. He's like, what is this? I don't know. And he's about to basically dictate a message telling Wilder where to go and, and what to do. When the one man in either army that understands Wilder's situation intervenes. I'm referring to Munfordville native Simon Bolivar Buckner. Buckner, seven months before, had been the man that surrendered Fort Donelson, 15,000 Confederates. He, he had, that, at that point, absolute mortal control over the fate of his garrison, just like John Wilder. He takes pity on Wilder and says, wait, wait, wait. Send back a message. And will you empower me if there's any other communication? I understand the situation. I understand what he's going through. Let me see what I can do. Bragg says, fine, whatever. And sends back a message and says, if you have any other further communication, talk to General Buckner. The Army's bed down that night. September 16th passes into September 17th. In the early morning hours of the 17th, Buckner is in his tent doing paperwork. Some things never change in the Army. And, uh, sir, you have a visitor, one of his staff officers said. Show him in. The visitor is wearing the uniform of a colonel in the United States Army. It's Wilder, who's come blindfolded. I come to you to find out what I ought to do. Wilder says to General Buckner. Now, Buckner only talked about this once in an interview that he gave in, to Confederate veteran in 1909. But even when you read that interview, you can read the feel. The feeling jumps off the page. And Buckner said, at that moment, I was touched. Quote, I would not have deceived that man for anything. Unquote. So Buckner takes Wilder on a bit of a tour, shows him the immediate area around him, and shows, you know, here's what I've got. You need to decide, can you live under this fire? And if you can, it's your duty to fight it out. Wilder thinks about it for a minute. We can't. I believe I will surrender. Now, 99 officers out of 100 would have said, great, let's go see General Bragg, but not Buckner. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you have information that the sacrifice of your, every man in this garrison will aid your cause elsewhere, it is your duty to fight it out. John Wilder thinks about it for a minute or two. I have no such information, he tells General Buckner. I believe I will surrender. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, they go and see General Bragg. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, that sunrise that the Federals thought they probably was going to be their last will not be their last as they march out with the honors of war, accept their paroles, and are sent south to Buell's army, which has now moved up to Bowling Green about 15, 20 miles away. The morning of September 17, 1862, add 4,000 prisoners to the Federal rolls. 
the total casualties of that day. Now, why am I dwelling on that? What else happened on September 17, 1862? Battle of Antietam. Bloodiest day in American military history, right? You better believe it. But everybody always gets the number wrong. Because in that 24 hours, it's the 23,000 and change at Sharpsburg, Maryland that occur. As a matter of fact, when Wilder marches out to his surrender, the battle's been underway in Maryland for two hours already with the time difference. Plus the 4,000 men at Munfordville, plus the other 150 at the Allegheny Arsenal explosion, and then various skirmishes along the line. It's actually 28,000 total casualties on September 17, 1862. Yes, I do grind that axe quite often. Sorry, I have to do it. Bragg now has his first victory as Army commander. And I want you to look at the map. Bragg's army's here at Munfordville. Buell, Munfordville. Buell's army's here at Bowling Green. Who has the advantage? Bragg does, right? Because he's between Buell and his supply base at Louisville. Fantastic situation tactically, right? Unsupportable logistically. Here's why. It's been a 4,000-man federal garrison here since the previous December. Where do you think they've gotten a lot of their food and provisions? The immediate area, exactly. They've picked it clean. Also, a very severe drought has set in. So you're not just talking about 30,000 thirsty men and hungry men, you're talking about over 10,000 hungry and thirsty horses and mules too. You've got rivers and creeks that are drying up, in some cases being reduced to nothing was one in Indiana would describe a few scum-covered puddles. And that will continue all through the rest of this campaign. So Bragg's quartermasters come to him after the surrender and say, sir, if we stay here more than 48 hours, we will starve. And that's a direct quote from Bragg's report. So despite the fact that tactically this is outstanding, logistically Bragg can't support it. So he has to move. So he moves northwest, or excuse me, northeast to Bardstown, about 40 miles, opens the road to Louisville. Buell gets into Louisville September 25th. At this point, if you look at the situation, pretty good for the Confederacy, right? At least on the map. They control everything effectively east of the Louisville-Nashville Railroad. But there are some problems with this Confederate expedition. The first one involves this garrison down here at Cumberland Gap. You didn't think I was going to forget them, did I? There's 9,000 of them, half of whom are from East Tennessee. They have legitimate reason to believe that if they are captured as prisoners of war, in other words, if that garrison surrenders, they will be hung as traitors to the Confederacy. It's one of the great untold stories of the Civil War. On September 17, 1862, they leave Cumberland Gap. They destroy the Gap, take everything they can with them, and they go on a cat and mouse, mouse hunt for 16 days, 219 miles to the Ohio River which is so low that when they get there, they're able to ford it. Think about that for a second. That tells you something about the severity of the drought. And they make it losing only 80 head of cattle. Some of the officers from that region, when they were shown the plan beforehand, thought that they'd be lucky to get out with half of the force. But they make it almost without loss. I devoted an entire chapter to my book about this, and it deserves far more attention than it has gotten. So you've got that shadow, suddenly active garrison over here, the cat and mouse hunt in East Tennessee, or excuse me, in Eastern Kentucky. But the bigger issue is all of those Confederates that they thought would join the Army, only about 5,000 have joined the Army. They brought 15,000 or more weapons into the state with them, expecting to just be able to hand them out and welcome male Kentuckians into the Confederate Army. It's not happening. As Buckner would later say, their hearts are with us, but their bluegrass and fat grass cattle are against us. Now there's actually something to this, because the loyal government in Frankfurt, which is now meeting in Louisville, because their capital is under new management, had passed a law in 1861 that if you 
joined the Confederacy and left the state to go fight for the Confederacy, you, all your property was forfeited. For a lot of merchants, for a lot of farmers, for a lot of horse farmers, that means a lot of money. It also, because Kentucky is a slave state, there are several very large slaveholders that would lose everything. Until Buell's army, which is sitting undefeated in Louisville, until they're taken care of, male Kentuckians are going to sit on the fence. And when you think about the potential penalties that they may face legally, you can understand why. Bragg, however, does not like this. He writes a message to Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, who, by the way, where was Jeff Davis born? Where did he go to college before transferring to West Point? Kentucky. He writes to him and says, if they, if, if, basically, if they don't rise up like we thought we, they would, quote, we must leave the garden spot of Kentucky to its cupidity, unquote. In other words, we're going to Take our ball and go home. Now, what do you think that reaction? I'd love to see Jeff Davis's face when he gets that message in Richmond about his home state. Coincidentally, of course, Kentucky is also the home birth state of Abraham Lincoln. So there are some shadows over this expedition. The biggest shadow that looms still is Buell's army, which now with new recruits, has massed up to about 70,000 personnel. What are they going to do? Bragg is convinced it's going to take Buell months to refit. So he's got some time. In fact, Bragg plans on October 4th to go to Frankfurt. The Kentucky government that's loyal to the Confederacy is with him, happens to be physically present with General Bragg. And so we're going to install them in Frankfurt. And what's the first order of business once they're installed? Scheduled for October 15th when the legislature will sit down and start meeting? It's not secession. They had voted on that the previous fall. Conscription. They're going to try and conscript male Kentuckians into the Confederate Army. And they're also going to try and tighten their grips on the levers of civil power over what part of Kentucky they control. Kentucky is very close to turning from blue to gray. Buell knows this. He's getting pressure from the War Department. They actually fire him, but they send the proviso of the firing instructions that turn over command to George Thomas unless you are about to actively participate in a campaign or fight a battle. Buell's planning his campaign into central Kentucky, and Thomas says, I'm not going to take command. General Buell should retain the command. So it's an, that's an interesting, that might be a whole presentation for a whole of the time. His personalities, Civil War commanders, Doug, and that episode more deeply. But nonetheless, Don Carlos Buell knows he's got to do something. He's got to do something now, both for geographic and strategic reasons, but also because what's coming up the following month, November 1862, midterm congressional elections. So politically, strategically, he's got to do something. As he looks at the map, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things I can say about the leadership of Don Carlos Buell, not all of them really good. But one thing I will say for the man is that the man can plan a campaign because as he looks at this map, he realizes he's really got two options when he leaves Louisville. When he attacks, he can either attack straight east toward Frankfurt and Lexington, fight a major battle somewhere up here, liberate these two cities, and then you've still got the Confederates in front of you. But intelligence has told him something else. You see where the 8 is here on the map where I've got the, cur where I've got the uh, pointer? That's a place called Camp Dick Robinson, which has been renamed Camp Breckenridge for the uh, Kentuckian who had just been governor, or excuse me, vice president for Buchanan. That's Camp Breckenridge. Breckenridge is the site for all the recruiting in Kentucky, but more importantly, it is the main supply base for the entire Confederate invasion. Buell realizes if I advance southeast, I will force the Confederates who are up here to concentrate in the central bluegrass. I'll be able to capture Frankfurt and Lexington with, probably with very little fighting, fight a major battle somewhere in here, threaten their supplies, force them to dance to my tune. What do you think of that plan? I like it. Napoleon said once, 
In war, dictate the operations of your enemy. You want to dictate the operations of your enemy. And by threatening Camp Dick Robinson, Buell will force the Confederates to dance to his tune. The Army will leave Louisville October 1st, 1862. Four columns. Northernmost column under Joshua Sill, 20,000 men will aim towards Frankfurt as a decoy. The other three columns, First Corps under Alexander McCook, Second Corps under Thomas Crittenden, Third Corps under Charles Champion Gilbert, 55,000 men all told, will advance southeast on Bardstown and into the central bluegrass looking for trouble. Bragg is on his way to Frankfurt. He's left Leonidas Polk along with William Hardy, but Polk's the senior one in command here at Bardstown. They get a message. They start figuring out, hey, the whole Yankee army, the main body of the Yankee army is bearing down on us. Bragg doesn't want to hear that. Do what you have to do. I'm going to Frankfurt, and we're going to have fun on the 4th at the inauguration. So the Confederates begin to retreat southeast. On the morning of the 4th, they install the governor. You can go visit the old, it's the old state capital today. It's really cool to go tour, as a matter of fact. That old building's still there. Bragg gives this fiery two-hour speech about how the unimpeachable, invincible power of the Confederacy will be in Kentucky forever. Everybody decides, goes and has the inaugural luncheon. And then they hear what sounds like thunder to the west. And then reports come in that there are 20,000 uninvited guests wearing blue on the outskirts of town. And as Edmund Kirby Smith later said, we skedaddled. That's an exact quote. And by that evening, after 30 days, Frankfurt is once again in the possession of the United States and will remain so for the rest of the war. Bragg, meanwhile, begins to concentrate his army in the central bluegrass, particularly at around a town northeast of Perryville, where I've got the cursor right now called Harrodsburg, which was the first for those of you scoring at home, the first permanent English settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains. I used to live there. But part of the Confederate Army gets run to ground on the evening of the 7th. The Federals are too close to in pursuit that when they stop that night outside of Perryville, the Federals are too close. Bragg says, still thinks this is only a portion of the Federal Army, not the main body. Orders Polk and Hardy, attack, fine, attack in the morning, push them back, and then move towards Harrodsburg. That night, Buell issues orders as soon as his troops are in position for a grand offensive against the 16,000 or so Confederates in and around Perryville. Next morning, they'll be skirmishing. Polk will realize the Federals are almost in position, and he will adopt what he calls the offensive-defensive strategy and will pull back into the city. Wait as long as he can, hold out at least for darkness, try and cover his movements. Bragg, 10 miles away, is listening for the sound of battle. Hears nothing. Rides down, gets there mid-morning, steaming mad, overrides every objection presented to him by Polk and Hardy, and decides to attack the northernmost part of the Union Army because it's the most visible and the most accessible part of the Union lines. Buell, for his part, because his troops have taken too much time, have been delayed getting into position, decides his grand offensive will start the morning of the 9th. He is, as a George McClellan protege, he continues to be part of the methodical school of tactics, shall we say. So the stage is now set for the main part of the Battle of Perryville. Two o'clock in the afternoon, Bragg's army launches their attack. Now, there are a lot of things that I can say about General Bragg as a general. One of the, ones that I will, one of the things that I will say is he's lazy. And why do I say this? If you look at Bragg's, if you look at any of Bragg's battles, he does the same tactic, general tactic, every time. It's called the echelon attack. If Bragg's army can push me back one mile, there's an intersection behind me, a mile behind me, called the Dixville Crossroads. Possession of it means that McCook is cut off from the rest of the Union Army and will be destroyed and will whittle down Buell's strength by a considerable amount. So that's the objective. That's the point of the fighting. Why do I say this is a lazy man's way to fight a battle? Everybody has their orders. All Bragg has to do is sit and watch. Does that make sense to everybody? 
You see Bragg do it here. You see him do it on New Year's Eve at Stones River. You see him do it the second day at Chickamauga. And then he sits back and watches it happen. It also robs the Confederate Army of flexibility. Because if you don't win everywhere, and they will win everywhere at Perryville, but they won't other places, if you don't win everywhere, you don't win. Does that make sense to everybody? That might be another talk, too, Civil War attack. I'll do that with Dave Powell. Dave Powell knows, does that better than anybody I know. Okay, so 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the first attacks go in, including one of the units that's one of my ancestors, actually, 21st Wisconsin. And five hours of fighting. The Federals are pushed back a mile. They hang on to the Dixville crossroads by the skin of their teeth. And darkness ends the fighting at 7 o'clock. Well, darkness in Leonidas Polk. Because as the last Confederate reserves are coming forward, an Arkansas Brigade under a guy named St. John Liddell, who coincidentally had fired the first shots that morning in the, in the morning skirmishes, Polk is riding forward to position them, and he rides to a group of troops that he thinks, well, they, they're in the darkness. It's, it's in the darkness. You can imagine what it looks like in October on a night like we're going to have tonight. And he starts giving them orders. And the commanding officer says, who are you? I'm General Polk, and pray, sir, who are you? I'm Lieutenant Colonel Squire Keith of the 22nd Indiana. And who, sir, once again, are you? Now, I don't know if Polk, being an Episcopal bishop, ever played poker. But if he, did, if he didn't, he should have, because he bluffs his way out. Well, you, sir, sir, shall find out. Rides down along the line, tells everybody to put their weapons down. Rides back across to Liddell's men. Colonel, General, every mother's son of them are Yankees. Open fire. Two-thirds, after three volleys in 90 seconds, two-thirds of the 365 men of the 22nd Indiana fall killed, wounded, or missing at the Dixville Crossroads. You can go visit the site where it happened today. Liddell, with his victory, sees the objective. He's got it right here. But what do you think Polk's mentality is after that near miss? He wants nothing more to do with anything and turns to Liddell and says, I want no more night fighting. And so, having pushed all the way to the goal line, Darkness and General Polk end the fighting. That night, General Bragg finally realizes the situation that he's in, partly because troops in the center and the south had actually pushed into Perryville late in the day and had been skirmishing in the city, the first major street fighting of the Civil War, for those of you scoring at home. And so that night, he orders a retreat back north, back towards Harrodsburg to the northeast. Now remember, what's Buell's objective? Buell's objective is not Harrodsburg up here. It's Camp Dick Robinson right here. And Bragg has very helpfully moved out of the way, hasn't he? Buell orders two-thirds of his army to pursue to Harrodsburg and orders one-third under George Thomas and Tommy Crittenden to continue east continue to pressure and threaten Camp Dick Robinson. This is a man who knows what he's about, can at least fight a war on a map. Bragg, when he gets to Harrodsburg, realizes that Thomas may cut him off if he's not careful. So he retreats back to Camp Dick Robinson, gets there on October 13th, and then he has a very nasty surprise. Is there a railroad connecting this front, Camp Dick Robinson, back towards Knoxville? No. There's not. What's about to hit in mid-October? Fall rains. The weather's about to turn. Just like up here, we all, the weather's taking its sweet time, and I'm totally okay with that, but the weather is about to turn. By the latter part of October, it's going to be very different from what it is now. As a matter of fact, the weather during this campaign was much like it was in the upper 70s, mid to upper 70s, low 80s. Actually, on the battle itself, the high was 82. So you're dealing with weather like what we're dealing with right now. But we all know within a matter of days, if not weeks, it's going to change. And we have modern forecasting. Bragg didn't, but he knows what's about to happen. And the dirt road, the old wilderness road, goes back across the mountains. 
Bragg's got Buell to his front, forcing a decision. Do I stay and fight General Buell? And what does he have behind him that's forcing a decision? The road, the weather. Because this is going to get very muddy and very inhospitable soon. As a matter of fact, when the Federals advance into East Tennessee in the spring of, or excuse me, in the fall of 1863, once they get to Knoxville, they basically forget overland communications and live off the land in East Tennessee. Okay, it's that difficult to you do in the winter. And so Bragg decides to abandon Kentucky. And by Halloween, the Confederates are back in Tennessee. And aside from isolated cavalry raids, they will never return to the state. And by the way, in case you're wondering if the Orphan Brigade, the famous Orphan Brigade, had been involved in this in any way, the answer is no. They'd been down at, at fighting at Baton Rouge along with Breckenridge. They're finally getting to Kentucky on October 15th. They are within sight of the mountains. They camp within sight of the mountains of Kentucky, just over the line in Tennessee on the night of the 14th of October. The next morning, everybody expects to once again trod their home state soil. And then that night, a message arrives that they are going to turn south because Bragg's army is coming out of the state. And with, uh, there's a great quote, with a sadness bowed with disappointment. These Kentuckians take one last look at their state in the distance and turn south. That's another human element to this drama that we should never forget. There was a lot of hopes, Confederate hopes, riding on this invasion. But Perryville, the Federal victory at Perryville, even though tactically they probably lost the battle that day, ultimately is a Federal victory because Buell is able to prosecute his campaign and force Bragg out of Kentucky. The Federal victory has secured Kentucky for the rest of the war. It was not cheap. In those five hours, 7,500 killed, wounded, or missing. For those of you scoring at home, that's 1,500 men an hour. It's one of the worst per hour casualty rates of the entire Civil War. And think of a fully loaded 747 crashing one every 17 minutes for five hours on those hills northwest of Perryville where the battle was fought, and you get a sense of the scale of human destruction. Perryville has burned itself. The fighting in 1862 has burned itself into the psyche of that area to this day. I speak from personal, personal experience. There was a farmer in northwest Boyle County where Perryville is named Squire Bottom, Henry Bottom. Henry Bottom was self-sufficient until October 8th, 1862, when the 600 acres of his farm became a majority of the Perryville battlefield. If you look at a map of the Perryville battlefield state historic site today, it's Squire Bottoms Farm plus other surrounding parcels, essentially, is what it is. After October 8th, 1862, and for the rest of his life, Squire Bottoms had to buy food. Think about that. And he, by no means, is an isolated case. And so here we are 159 years later. And stories like that, you don't have to scratch the surface very far in that community, and you'll find the after effects of stories like that. So this stuff still matters, that's for sure. I conclude my discussion today, our discussion, and to sum up the Kentucky campaign, my discussion the way I began it, with that quote from Abraham Lincoln. I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Well, in the summer and fall of 1862, it sure looked like the Federals might lose Kentucky. But after the fighting at Perryville, the Confederate retreat, they did not lose Kentucky. And three years later, they did not lose the game. And so that makes this battle, 159 years ago today, one of the most important battles of the entire Civil War. And I encourage you, if you haven't been down to see it, go down and visit. And if you have been down, go back and see it. They continually add to the battlefield. There's always more stuff to see. So, but on that note, I will conclude. And I'd just like to say thank you all for your attention. Thank you for spending time today. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Given the importance of Kentucky, should the South have done more? Um, I actually answer this when I do bus tours. 
because when I end my Perryville tours, I don't end them on, in Perryville. I end them at Harrodsburg. And I tell this, get comfortable, this is going to take a second. If you're familiar with the Maryland campaign, how many folks have ever been to Antietam, South Mountain? Okay. You are you're no doubt aware that as McClellan moves out from Frederick, they fight first at South Mountain, having forced the South Mountain passes. There's general concentration of the Confederate Army at Sharpsburg, and then you fight the main decisive battle of the campaign in and around Sharpsburg, Maryland, Antietam, as it's known. That is what's supposed to happen here, but it doesn't. Perryville, in Bragg's mind, is the preliminary fight. Push the Federals off, disengage, complete the concentration around Harrodsburg, fight the main battle at Harrodsburg. This is supposed to be their equivalent of South Mountain, but it's not because there's no equivalent to Antietam. Bragg's all set to fight at Harrodsburg, but that's why I mentioned Buell and his maneuver, continuing to send part of his army east to cut Bragg off from Tennessee. And so it forces Bragg out by maneuver, as opposed to fighting a big climactic battle larger than Perryville. So Perryville, by default, becomes the big climactic battle of the campaign. Does that make sense to everybody? That's kind of, a, it's kind of an intricate thing to discuss. It usually works better when I've been talking to you for a day or two about the campaign. But think about it in those terms. Think about what the commanders were in, envisioned of that battle and of the subsequent campaign versus what actually ended up happening. So hopefully that comes somewhere close to answering your question. Other questions? Yeah. That's a good question. What was Phil Sheridan's role? And I, I was telling Doug, I've been getting over a sinus infection, so my brain's a little mushy. It's funny, as I was driving in here and turned on Sheridan Road, I was like, oh, yeah, I need to mention Phil Sheridan. <laughs> so thank you for the reminder. Phil Sheridan, and the Wisconsin unit that was in it was the 24th, by the way, with a 17-year-old adjutant who everybody laughs at because he's in, he, when he's moving the regiment on the parade field, his voice is still cracking. But at the end of this day, because they see him as one of, the, one of the sergeants will say he is cold as ice on the battlefield. They will not laugh at him ever again. Arthur MacArthur, whose son Douglas, of course, goes on to, in many ways, the foundation of the MacArthur military dynasty is Perryville. Sheridan, Phil Sheridan's division, I talked about Liddell's brigade, I talked about the initial skirmishing west of town that morning. The guys that the Arkansas guys are fighting are Phil Sheridan. And Sheridan is the one that actually pushes them back into the city. And then there'll be some skirmishing west of Perryville for the rest of the day. But Sheridan's main role in the spotlight for this battle is that opening, opening skirmish. He gets, he gets the, opening, the opening number um, first thing that morning on the 8th. So, in some ways, this is the essential domino in the series of dominoes that will take him from Perryville to Appomattox and the series of promotions and subsequent commands that he gets. So, other questions? Actually, Bragg's plan, I, I think what you're referring to is the cavalry, because he had his cavalry going all over the field trying to find the federal flank. And eventually he ran out of time, and at 2 o'clock he had to go. Um, and there, I think that's what you're, I think that's what you're referring to. Because Bragg liked to move troops all over the place, but at Perryville, he didn't seem to do it as aggressively as he does at other places. I, I, if memory serves, I think that's kind of what you're referring to, because there was a mixed force trying to find the north flank of the Federals, and they never quite did, at least in time. And then Bragg's like, Bragg realizes, okay, we've got to go at two, so we still have some daylight left. And that's basically how that plays out. So, Yes, and then I'll come back. That's a great question. Bragg and Kirby Smith's relationship. There's no uniformed commander or one commander of this expedition. Jeff Davis says they are to cooperate. But if they ever join together on the field, Bragg automatically assumes command as senior officer. 
So when I'm talking about the concentration at Harrodsburg, it's basically Kirby Smith's men marching southwest towards Harrodsburg. And when they unite immediately after the battle, Bragg at that point says, I'm senior officer, the junction has happened, we're here. Kirby Smith was not involved at Perryville at all. Had there been another big climactic battle at Harrodsburg or at Camp Dick Robinson, he would have been right in the thick of it. But Kirby Smith is not, not engaged. None of his troops are engaged at, uh, at Perryville on the 8th of October. So, and that's part of the problem for the Confederates, is that divided command. Bragg doesn't control every tr all the troops in the state. It hampers his ability to unite, concentrate, and really coordinate a response to the Federals. They were up in Frankfurt and Lexington, that area, and then they moved southwest towards Harrodsburg. So they're the ones that Joshua Sill had chased out during the inauguration. So, yes, the Orphan Brigade was not there. There was Kentucky CS Cavalry. There were some Kentucky CS units that were in, but the actual Orphan Brigade itself 4th, 5th, 6th, and 9th Kentucky, I believe it is, CS, we're all down in Louisiana. And for political reasons, mostly because the commanders down there didn't want to release the Kentuckians. They needed them for an offensive against Baton Rouge. They, um, they missed this entire campaign, which is tremendously ironic when you think about it. Come on down to Madison and see us. Our next special exhibit opens November 5th. It's called Souvenirs of Service, The Things They Kept. And we've done some refreshing and revamping to some of our exhibits. Um, so please do come on down and see us next time you're in Madison. And we're still on the Capitol Square. We're still free. And we're still located right next to where some of the best brats and the best cold beer is. And we're not that far from the old-fashioned either. So please do come on down and see us at the Veterans Museum. Thank you all very much.